You're listening to Design Tomorrow. What you're hearing is the sound of a vintage computer. Not quite an antique, but well on its way. Once its large mechanical switch was thrown, it could take several moments before its internal system was ready to read the magnetic disk you'd inserted. The zap of electricity you sent into the box had to make its way through a labyrinth of resin and lead and glass, thousands of surface-mounted components, most just a millimeter or two wide. Now, if that sounds intricate, comparing this machine's innards to a CPU of today makes it look like a box of tinker toys pretending to be a computer. The machine equivalent of three dogs stacked on top of each other under a trench coat. Except this machine wasn't pretending. It was the top of the line 35 years ago. And believe it or not, it was considered a portable computer. Now let me quickly describe it for you. It's a box that's a bit wedge-shaped, like a big piece of cheese the size of a suitcase. Its base a bit wider than the top when you stand it on its end and use the handle that folds out. It's roughly the width of an old keyboard. In fact, the base is the keyboard. When you set the thing down and then lay it on its back, the base pops out and reveals a keyboard on the underside. And on the inside of the box where the base was is a 9-inch amber monochrome monitor on the left and a couple of 5 and a quarter inch floppy disk drives on the right. Now, I mentioned that this machine was considered portable, and technically, it was. It did have a handle. But the whole thing weighed about 30 pounds, and without an internal battery... Wherever you lugged this thing to needed to have a wall plug available, so I don't imagine many people hauled this thing to their local coffee shop to get a little work done. And anyway, this was 1984. Coffee culture barely even existed back then. Starbucks was just a tiny local company in Seattle with a handful of shops. In fact, that was the year that they served their very first latte. True story. Before that, it was only old school drip. So you get the idea. A lot has changed in 35 years, both for coffee shops and for the machines we use in them. Now, just a couple of years after this computer was first made, it was discontinued, replaced by something a little bit sleeker, a little bit more powerful, and a little bit faster. And that probably brought its $4,000 price tag down a bit, making it affordable to my dad, who brought one home around then. It sat on a table in our den, and he would let me sit in front of it and type words onto the screen, which, I must say, was a thing of beauty. Nine inches of screen would not have felt small back then, certainly not to a little kid like me, but not even to an adult, because most TVs weren't much bigger. But this little screen was special. It was this inky black field, on which glowed a single amber color. Any text or line rendered on it projected an almost magical warmth with it. It had the aesthetics of the opening scene of Blade Runner. It's text like the golden industrial fires of a glittering Los Angeles and the massive corporate pyramid looking down upon it. It's strange, actually, that Blade Runner, a film made two years before this computer we've been talking about, depicted the very year in which we're living right now, 2019. And it got very little right about that future. Sure, it got the cynical, sprawling, and entrenched capitalistic fascism right. Kind of nailed it, actually. But it projected a technological landscape pretty unlike our own. One where the most impressive screens floated in the sky, hawking brands that are long since defunct, but the rest of the screens, the screens within reach of most people, looked a lot like the one I've been describing. This black and amber low-fidelity pixel field of beauty. This special window onto a mental world, a place where views and events triggered by keystrokes and commands took place in the mind. It was so formative for me. It shaped how I see the world, how I think about it, and how I participate now in its making. And so today... I want to think about how screens and the images they reveal 
are just as much a manifestation of the world from which they come as they are the raw materials of a story about the next one, the future. You're listening to Design Tomorrow. I'm Chris Butler. Stay tuned. Design Tomorrow is a podcast about design, technology, and being human, which, admittedly, is a lot to be about. But in all things, we hope to grow in our awareness that what we do and think today can create a better tomorrow. You can follow the show on Twitter at Design Tomorrow. Just leave all the vowels out. That's at D S G N T M R R W. You can also visit the show's website at designtomorrow.co. And if you want to get in touch directly, you can email me at chris at designtomorrow.co. I'd love to hear from you. And now, let's get back to the show. was something special about the computer of my youth. Not just the IBM portable PC 5155 that I described in such detail at the beginning of the show, but all computers of the time, the state of computing in the 1980s. I've been returning to that thought again and again over my adult life, as I get further and further away from that time, mostly in an attempt to understand what changed in that time, the time between my childhood when computers inspired me, and now, when they just don't. I even made an incomprehensible, or in other words, not very good, short animation about this in my final year of college, which I am sure I will regret having linked to in the show notes. But that was 15 years ago, when the computers I was thinking about were themselves ancient, as far as tech goes, and the computer I was using to make that animation might as well have been the same age compared with what we have now. And just for the sake of comparison, the computer I used to produce that incomprehensible animation was a Sony VAIO Digital Studio desktop machine with a 2.8 GHz Pentium 4 processor, 512 megabytes of RAM, a 160 gigabyte hard drive, and NVIDIA's GeForce FX5200 graphics card. Nerd alert. The point is, these were good specs for the time, but compared with today's entry-level pocket computers, they're sad. But I was excited about that computer back then. Not because it was an exciting computer. It ran Windows XP, which is about as far from exciting as any interface has ever been. But because of what I was trying to do with it. I bought this computer because its processor was fast, and because it had a DVD burner and a bunch of audio and video inputs useful to a filmmaking student. But other than that, I didn't really care about what was going on inside of it. I only thought about the hardware when there was a glitch and the machine couldn't keep up with what I was pushing it to do. In my case, managed thousands of layers of moving images and even more thousands of layers of sound. But when I was a kid, I was excited by computers. By being in the strange digital flatlands they projected into my world, by hearing them buzz and hum, by talking to them with rudimentary code, by adapting to their alienness. As a child, I was rarely trying to do something specific with a computer. I just wanted to learn their language, to explore their world. So what is different about computers today? Shouldn't they offer all that same magic but just an exponentially greater supply. I know in returning to this thought so often, in turning it over and over in my mind, that it is not merely a matter of techno-ennui, 
It is not just that being immersed in computers for three decades, I've become bored by them. In the parlance of a parent constantly concerned with screen time, I intuit that this is a matter of quality, not quantity, and of sublimity, not supremacy. It's about what happens to a thing at scale. It has to become boring in order to preserve consistency. The expansion of computing, the invasion, as I put it earlier, is surely worth concern. You know, screens everywhere. But I must admit that when I feel the nostalgia trigger, it's tied more to the visual experience of computing than computing as a concept. And though I could geek out on the full sensory experience of early computing, the touch of the peripherals, the buttons, the dials, the sounds of the drives and the fans and the keys, the warmth, even the smell... It's typically about what's on the screen that takes me back, what I saw when I used them. After all, the industrial design of computers of the 21st century is, if you can shed any affectation you may have for the old and the slow and the discolored going on, just vastly objectively better than that of the late 20th. Space Gray is always going to appeal to me more than, well, every computer of the 80s and 90s beige. I guess we can thank Johnny Ive for that. I mean, traditionally, notebooks are made from multiple parts. But the problem is, when you have multiple parts, you, you add size and weight, and, and you increase the opportunity for failure. And the, the, the huge breakthrough that we had with, with the MacBook was to replace all of those parts with just one part. And that one part we called the unibody. It's never been about the boxes for me. It's always been about what's on them. The screen has always been a window upon another world and has always had the power to seduce us away, mentally, from this one. But with every year, the window opens wider and wider, making it not just difficult to avoid gazing through, but threatens to envelop us completely, its world indistinguishable from our own. That has always terrified us, the blurred line between the real and the virtual. Right now, we're inside a computer program. Is it really so hard to believe? Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. This... This isn't real. What is real? Virtual reality, even in its first blocky, stuttering incantation, sparked a moral panic among parents everywhere who worried that their kids would strap screens to their faces and never take them off. God damn it, Carol. I never unplug a program when I'm engaged. You just ruined the whole effect. Well, guess what? We have that now. Except we don't call it virtual reality. We call it phones. We call it being connected. It's the terrifying feedback loop between the selfie and self-esteem. And though wildly more sophisticated, the face screens of today are just as niche as they were back then. VR 2.0 is still for the very, very, very geeky few. But phones are for everyone. And really, it's not just about ubiquity. The view the screen provides, coupled with their increasing size and the infrequency with which our eyes gaze upon any view unobstructed by them, creates a special gravity that threatens to pull us completely, mind, body, and spirit, into their glassy, malignantly false world. The screens of the past didn't do that, because they couldn't. It's not just that the screens of my childhood were smaller, it's that the world they revealed was smaller, flatter, and more still. That's what I think captivated me then, and still does now. Held back, of course, by the processing power and graphic fidelity of the time, the computer of my childhood was not just slow. It slowed things down. Even though it crunched numbers faster than our brains could even think of them, blinking cursors, keystrokes, lists of values, and shrill beeps punctuating executed commands were all the deceptively basic products of extensive calculations. The early personal computer rarely had a reason to show the speed at which it moved. 
all the familiar and desired operations available then. The command line, the word processor, the game of solitaire, they all buried the computer's processing power beneath layers of visualizations that felt slow to the human eye because they were slow. The graphics processor that made them possible was always playing catch-up to the supercalculator running within the machine. We had to wait for the simplest things to happen, and that gave us time to think. Time to wonder. The slowness of the thing was one benefit to my childhood mind, but the simplicity of the visual language of its software was even more so. It was symbolic, geometric, mathematical, so much so that it was almost enigmatic. Drawing meaning from watching loading scripts run their coursing lines of symbols and numbers was about as likely to me then as deciphering a wall of hieroglyphics buried within the pyramids. And that's an apt metaphor, really, because the mystery of the box, the magic that made this machine go, drew out my young imagination as readily as a book with no pictures. In order to connect with the world of the computer, I had to think. I often think back to screens I had left on for hours, if not days. I could return again and again, like Lucy through the wardrobe to a world unchanged, no matter how long I had been away. The content on the screen remained still and unchanged, perhaps only the delicate blinking of the cursor, marking its own special time. The machine waited patiently for me. I had as much time as I needed to consider my next keystroke and what I left there was put in an almost suspended animation. It was magically atemporal. But what computer is like that today? What computer doesn't pull us into its reality on its terms, nagging us to return and never leave? What computer doesn't accelerate experience? What computer's world, its frenzied coke binge of information, doesn't bleed out into our own, if not outright create our world entirely? Maybe this whole thing I'm working through is simply about the passage of time. That thing that happens to our world because of what happens to our mind and body as we pass from childhood to adulthood. The loss of wonder. Maybe this is all just about how you can't go home again. But maybe it isn't. Maybe there's something true here something we, the makers, can extract from the past and bring forward. If we had to do it over again, could we have made computers that preserved the role of imagination in their use, that were self-limiting for our sake? Could we have made computers that didn't mutate upon our world in an explosion of algorithmic virality? Could we have had an acceleration of processing power without an abdication of reality. Is this, as Kevin Kelly has put it, what technology wants? More importantly, is this what we want? I wonder. And I hope you do too. it for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Design Tomorrow. If you did, find the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and give it a rating and a review. Special thanks today to my old friend Abel Paris, who provided much of the music for this episode. Abel is a great designer and artist and recently launched a new music project under the moniker Commuter. You can find his music at commuter.world or you can just search on Spotify for Commuter. That's K A. M-U-T-E-R Like Abel, all the music I use on the show is independently produced. That means individuals like you and me making things entirely on their own. Independence is so important to media. And generally, what that means is that media is paid for by the makers or, for the most part, the customers directly. 
It's not advertising fodder, nor is it marketing for some large corporation. It's a labor of love. So I'd like to urge you to support as much independent media as you are able. Think of the people you know. Among them are probably one or two who are producing independent media. How can you support them? Is it by subscribing to their newsletter, their periodical or podcast? Is it sharing it, becoming a patron? However you can, do it. Independent media makes the world more interesting. Now, if you don't know any independent media makers, I'll put a list of my favorites in the show notes. I hope they'll enrich your life as much as they do mine. In the meantime, I'd love to know what you think. Email me any feedback you have at chris at designtomorrow.co or tweet me at designtomorrow. That's at D-S-G-N-T-M-R-R-W. And by the way, I've mentioned the website on every episode so far, and each time any of you who have typed in that URL have been greeted by basically nothing. That won't be true for much longer. A better website is on the way. And thanks for listening. And remember, what we do and think today can create a better tomorrow. I'll see you then. give us instant access to the state of the world. Troop movements, Soviet missile tests, shifting weather patterns. It all flows into this room and then into what we call the Whopper computer. Whopper, what is that? It's a war operation plan response. This is uh, Mr. Richter. Paul, would you like to tell these gentlemen about the Whopper? <clears throat> well, the Whopper spends all its time thinking about World War III. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, it plays an endless series of war games using all available information on the state of the world. The Whopper has already fought World War III as a game, time and time again. It estimates Soviet responses to our responses to their responses, and so on. Estimates damage, counts the dead, then it looks for ways to improve well, but its But the point is that the key decisions of every conceivable option in a nuclear crisis have already been made by the Whopper. So what you're telling me is that all this trillion-dollar hardware is really at the mercy of those men with the little brass keys. That's exactly right. Whose only problem is that they're human beings. But in, what, 30 days, we could replace them with electronic relays. Get the men out of the loop. Gentlemen, I wouldn't trust this overgrown pile of microchips any further than I could throw it. And I don't know if you want to trust the safety of our country to some uh, silicone diode... <laughs> General, nobody is talking about entrusting the safety of the nation to a machine, for God's sake. We'll keep control, but we'll keep it here at the top where it belongs. All right, gentlemen. I think I'm going to recommend...